Let's get started. I was a sophomore in high school. I just finished cross-country practice. I was sweaty, and I was uh, thirsty. I don't know if you ever find that in any place you live or work, you find the best place, like the best drinking fountain. The best drinking fountain was in the wood shop. By this time, it was already a teacher's aid in the wood shop. And uh, what had happened in that situation was, is I was walking through, and, and I, I, again, just barely got out of cross country, went, and I just drank tons and tons of water. I'm just sitting there just as, as thirsty as I could be. Because I, was a, uh, because I was a teacher's aide, I was watching a kid who was actually making an ashtray. He had a block of wood, and he was hollowing out uh, most of it with a chisel. And I said, hey, there's a faster way to do this, and it'll actually make it quicker for you. And I said, have you ever used the auger bit? And he said, no. And I said, I'll show you. So still possibly just honestly wearing some of my cross-country stuff, I went over, and I got what's an auger bit. This is an auger bit. And an auger bit, what its purpose is, is it's slow revolutions to take out a lot of material pretty fast. So I went in, I set it up, I put it in a chuck, it tightened everything down. And I didn't realize is that someone had turned uh, the drill press all the way up to its fastest position. I hit start, and automatically this auger bit became invisible like the spokes of a wheel. It was spinning that fast. And because of the revolutions, and it was loggered in, when it should have been a straight st uh, shaft, it started to bend. And so now it's spinning around like this, but I can't see it. What I didn't realize happened was is that this machine now starts shaking, almost like, like a, water, a washing machine that's out of balance. I went to put my hand up and put my hand in the path of the auger bit. Uh, I got broke. My wife made a comment. She goes, you're calling this broke. The proper is broken. I go, yeah, but broke sounds how I feel. I was broke. My hand slashed against and automatically hanging uh, by skin was my middle finger. The tendon was cut off and went up my arm. And I got taken to the emergency room. Three, three and a half hours of surgery to basically put everything back together again. They used a nail gun, which I thought was ironic, to nail my finger back together. Because I drank so much water, they said that you cannot go to sleep. You're going to have to be awake during the procedure. They perform what they call a beer block on my arm. It's not as cool as it sounds. <laughs> so I can see the whole procedure being done to my finger. I remember one time, I'm on, literally, I, this is not to be because it's, it's, it's Easter. I was on a table like, like a crucifixion. They're working on my arm over here, and the IVs are coming in over here, right? And I remember the guy goes, is there any problems? I go, yeah, my nose itches. And he reaches down with his rubber glove, and he's scratching my nose, and he goes, you don't want to know how much you're paying for me to scratch your nose right now. I didn't think it was that funny. Anyway, we got done with it. It hurt. Went home. Week later, went to have it checked out. When a doctor takes an uh, x-ray, puts it up, and then cusses, that's bad. Let me say that again. When a doctor takes an x-ray, sticks it up on the light box, and cusses, that's bad. I go, what's wrong? He goes, I didn't attach it right. And he goes, my only fix is I have to break it again. I go, no, I'm good. Uh, I'm, I'm all right. I'm not going through this again. I have a problem in my bloodstream that I don't take any of the Novocaines well, which means whenever the, I've been shut up for things like my teeth or my hands, I feel all pain no matter what. So... Uh, yeah, the thought of just going through more procedures really doesn't make me happy. Here's the fun part about it. What he did was when he put the finger back on, he twisted the knuckle to a degree that it's off. So I'll show you what happens. If I close my fingers, my middle finger flops over my other fingers. It's just that much off that it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter how fast I do it, it flops over the other fingers. And so, again, he goes, we can straighten that out. No, 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 that's okay. I don't want to be broke again, right? The problem was, for a long time, my finger uh, froze in what I would consider an inappropriate position. <laughs> and the doctor said to me, if you don't get that thing loosened up, you're going to uh, have an interesting adulthood. Can you imagine being a pastor going, why is he flip me off every Sunday? I don't even get it. <laughs> By the grace of God, it finally broke loose, and I can now move it. But I will tell you this, the, the movie you saw about scars, I can see the scar. I know what happened. It goes up and it goes around the knuckle, and I know through that whole process what took place. Here's what's funny is, is it's broke, but now it's fixed. And I will tell you later in this sermon about what that means to me. But here's what I know. I know what broke feels like, 
And I know what the process of being fixed feels like, and it definitely is a long process. What we're going to do is start a four-week series today on this concept of broke. And folks, I don't even have to say it, this world is broken. We live in a broken world. And so we're going to start this process today looking at what Christ did. But we want to go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 20 through, 22 through 24. God is speaking about Adam when he says, Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Who's the other us? Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand to take also of the tree of life, eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground which we, which he was taken, from which he was taken. What's interesting is, even in that verse, up to this point, Adam's been going through the garden just eating of the trees that are there. Notice that in the very first sentence, he will have to go what? Work the ground. It's right there. The breaking is already beginning. He drove, him, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What's interesting is, is that the moment in the curse of Adam and Eve, there's a curse on the ground. Do you guys understand that? This is Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Cursed is the ground because of you. You understand the ground was pretty happy until Adam messed up. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Man, the ground becomes corrupt. This last week we've had a guy that's been helping us over at the Discovery Campus mowing down some grass and he himself has a bad hip, and so it's been hard for him. And so I just said, look, you've done two five-hour days. Go home. I'll finish. And so yesterday, I was out there with a weed whacker. And I was trying to think, well, maybe if I think the weeds look good, I can just leave them there. But they don't, right? And I'm cutting these things down, and there's weed juice flying everywhere. And this whole time, I'm going, I know what I'm preaching. I'm like, ah, the ground is messed up. And we know. Folks, here's what's interesting. It says, Thorns of thistle shall bring forth, uh, forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. But it goes on even farther. In Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, it says this, For the creation, the world, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to the corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Meaning, because of our sin, the world has been in this place of bondage. And we know that. There are times this earth tries to kill us. Right? The ground shakes. Wind starts to move and tornadoes form. And you have hurricanes that come off the sea, and you have tsunamis, and you have volcanoes that explode, and every once in a while a meteor comes from out of a spell, bam, right? It's broken. It's broken. But it's interesting that it says that it wants to be set free, but it's in bondage because of our sin. From the beginning, it has been broke. Oh, the fun of technology. Can't figure out what's going on with all this fun stuff. Uh, there we go. Then it comes back. Well, it comes back for me, not for you. Um, and you want to see a mouse over there? Tell me when I get to the one with the green. Right through there. No. Oh, I just opened my Bible program. That's good. That's better than something else I could have opened. All right. The creation itself will be set free. For, do you have it yet? There you go. So what you have is that in that, listen, it says, the creation itself will set free from its bondage, the corruption obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. Go on to verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This world has been subject to the brokenness that we understand. But the world in which we live is broken because of our sin. 
Imagine us. Imagine us. It's interesting that when you become old enough, you realize something's wrong. Not only with the world, but with yourself. Have you ever been blown away by the things that you do? That you never planned to do? That you never thought you would do? And how quickly you can justify your actions? It's scary. Paul says it this way in Romans 7, 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You ever been there? I woke up today to do good. And this is where I find myself. And you're blown away of how much I have said this over and over again and will continue to do so. No one on the face of this earth will do more damage to me than me. No one. The choices I make, the people I hurt, the decisions that I put before myself, the options I only give myself. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. You ever been there? How many times you promised God, I'll never be here again? Ta-da! Here we are. Round number 532. And so we know that there's something broken in us. We get it. Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God shows his love for us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us that while we are still sinners. I've talked to so many people that say, yeah, I want to go to church. When I get my life straight, when I get things better, that's when I'll go. Yeah, I want to go to church when, when, I, when I'm no longer messing up. It's almost, like, it's almost like if we can just get there and we're good enough, then God won't have to love us as much. When God is saying, no, 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 while you're still sinners, while you're still sinners, that's when I loved you. Not when you got your stuff together, because by the way, when we get our stuff together, it's all fake anyway. I grew up in Odessa, Texas. Don't even stop for gas there. Just keep on going. And what, the story I'm about to tell you, when I found out that in, where, I, where my friends in Orange County, which is where I grew up, that there were actually orange trees and they would talk about having orange fights, I got jealous because in Odessa, Texas, we didn't have oranges. We had rocks. And if you're a boy, you still got to have some kind of fight, so a rock fight works, right? But my friends had orange fights. I'm like, wusses. I remember one time, I, I, I thought if I could come to God, I thought if I could come to him and, and, and I could hide, because, I, because what I don't want people, to, when people, we don't want people to know is that we're really truly messed up, so we covered up. I remember I was, I came in probably seven years old, and I was doing this, and I, and I was trying to act like that I was thinking really hard. Like, I'm like, oh, she's really thinking about stuff. She's just, oof, whew, ooh, what to think about, what to think about. And my mom, being bright, realizes something's going on. Jess, what's wrong with your head? No, no, mom, I'm, I'm, it's, it's good. Now, the reason why is we've done rock fights before, right? And she had told me, don't rock fight anymore. So she comes up to me, and she pulls my hand away, big welt, big cut, because I got hit in the head. I'm like, well, Billy threw a rock at my head. Doesn't tell her I just had thrown a rock at Billy's head and missed him by that much, right? Because eventually, when you're that age, you don't have good aim, but eventually someone's getting hit. Does that make sense? But I remember how I just felt like if I could cover up my brokenness. Does that make sense? She wouldn't know. And I feel like we come to God that way. We want to cover up our brokenness. We want to come to him and we want to say, oh, no, 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 I, I'm good. And God goes, no, 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 I already know you're broken. I already know you're messed up. But we think somehow if we come to church and, and we cover it up or we, or we don't have, you know, a limp. I love in football where you see the guy that really has gotten hurt and he's trying to walk off the field like he's not hurt, but everybody knows he's hurt. And he gets to the sideline and what does he do? He just crumbles, right? Isn't that you sometimes? 
trying to share with them, you're not broken, you're okay, but as soon as you get to a dark place, you just crumble? And God goes, no, I, I know you're broke. I know you're messed up. But God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we get our stuff together. And I know we just like, well, maybe I can have some control of this. The moment that you think you have control of it is the problem, because you'll keep hiding. Since therefore we know we have been justified by his blood, justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Jerry had told me that he was listening to a speaker, uh, R.C. Sproul, who just said that we're enemies. Did you think about that? I've always, Jerry told that, and I started thinking, and I got to this verse, and, and, and I think about it is that I always knew that I was against God in the sense that I had sinned, but this verse says that I was his enemy. How could I have been his enemy? Well, when I put myself in the position that should be his position, I become his enemy. But isn't it amazing? It says, for while we, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You don't do that for your enemy. You do nothing for your enemy. And yet, while I was his enemy, God says, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to reconcile you. The word reconcile, the best way it was explained to me is when you have a checkbook, and you have to reconcile your bank statement, and you got to make everything work out. I never could do that. If I got to a dollar, I was really happy. Some of you got to get to the penny. God help you. But I'm just telling you, if I got to the dollar, I was really happy. But, but, but God says, no, I want to reconcile. I want to bring everything back into account. I want to make everything right. And he did that for you. Listen, he did that for you while you were his enemy. Doing the thing that you are most ashamed of. Like somehow God wouldn't know. And God goes, in that moment, in that place, in that dark spot, that's where I want to come into. Because that's when you're broken. And in your brokenness, I can do something with you being broken. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Listen, shall we be saved by his life? That's a great verse. You could stop right there. Shall we be saved by his life? But it goes on. More than that. Extra. Bonus level. More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I'm reconciled. I'm back in rightness with him. But it feels wrong because I know I'm still broken. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Listen to that. We have a God that is judging impartially while we're on this earth. But watch this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefather, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. We use this verse as a part of our Good Friday service. And I want to thank all who made that possible. What a great service that was. To understand that it says that we were ransomed. And I made this comment Friday night, and I'll say it again. If you kidnap my son, what would I do to get him back? What would I sell? How many of you would I go to say, can you give me any? I got to go get my son. And we were ransomed. We were kidnapped by sin. We were kidnapped by our own flesh. Listen, Satan doesn't kidnap me. I go willingly. I go willingly into my sin. And God goes, but I'm ransoming you even while you're walking away from me. And not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like the lamb without blemish or spot. He bought me. Not when I was doing right. Not when I got my stuff together. Not when I was in the middle of a Bible study. He ransomed me when I was still running away from him and running to my flesh. Colossians 1, 
21 through 23. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today, and there's a reason why. For those of you who are coming for the first time, I want you to see that throughout the New Testament, there is over and over this message of Jesus reconciling, ransoming, justifying, atoning for us. It is the message of the New Testament that he would come to us in our worst spot and say, I have bought you. I have loved you. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. By the way, it doesn't say who had done evil deeds. Doing in the process of present tense. I just learned what present tense means, so I'm using it a lot. He has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Did you hear that? He now is reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. See, the problem that we have is we don't understand this concept of perfection. Perfection for you is perfect, flawless. Nothing is wrong. I will tell you one of the stories that happened while we were in Israel. We were in a place called Bethshan. And in Bethshan, the only biblical connection is that the king Saul, was his body when he was dead was hung on its walls. Other than that, there's not a lot that happens in the Bible in this city, but it was a beautiful city. And we were walking around. We were just blown away by what was considered truly a modern Roman city. But the one thing that blew us away were these gigantic columns, and I mean huge columns that had fallen down. And they were slowly using cranes to restore these columns back up. It was one of them, and we, we, we took a picture of it, and we'll try to show it sometime, of basically one that had fallen and it cracked and stuff. And so when they put it together, they, they sealed it all back together, and you could tell the lines where they had put mortar, and they had made sure it was almost practically glued back together, and so the column was up and it was straight, but we would look at it and go, yeah, look at it, but look at all those cracks, look at all those flaws, and Jesus goes, no, 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 in my world, that is perfect. In my world, that is perfect, because it has been restored back to wholeness, and the chunks that were taken out of it that were filled in with mortar Jesus goes, that's what I do when I make you perfect. You still have the cracks. You still have the places where you were broke. But what I do is I come in and I fill those things in and I bring you back to wholeness. That is God's concept of perfection. And so here's the deal. Folks, when you look at me, I want you to understand that I have been broken. Broken. I see the scar of my hand and I realize the work and the effort to get to the point that it flops over the way that it does. But I'm telling you, by God's definition, this finger is perfect because it's back to wholeness. And so what happens is, is that when you look, what you want to do is you want to hide all of the cracks and you want to hide all the brokenness. And what you do is when you do that, you actually hide the testimony. You hide the story of this is when God came into my life and put me back together. And yeah, used whatever he could, super glue, Play-Doh, it didn't matter. He did what he did to bring me back to wholeness. I was a junior in high school when my dad got in trouble. It was awesome. We were in our living room in Brea, California. My dad was a big guy. 6'4", 220, played both ways in high school, was in the military, big man. I am, again, this, 70 pounds lighter, dripping wet, 130 pounds. He shoved me. I'm like, all right, old man, I shoved him back. He shoved me, I shoved him back. I'm like, it's on. And I, and I knew what I had to do. I had to go for his knees. He's too top-heavy. I had to go for the knees. There's no way I was going to match his strength, but I had to take him off balance. So I got low, and I grabbed him by the knees, and I lifted with all that I could, and I got him this far off the ground. And then I drove him into the couch and snapped all four legs off the, off the couch, snapped him in halves. Boom. 
I'm on top of him. He's about to kill me when my mom walked in. Thank you, mom. But she's not yelling at me. She's yelling, Ed, what are you doing? You broke the couch. What are you doing? I'm like, yeah, he started out. I was standing here minding my own business. Uh, old man drove him down. Uh. My mom's yelling at my dad. I'm like, dad's in trouble. Dad. I was awesome. He's trying to explain. He knows she has that look in her eye. It's like, oh, it was great. Because I wasn't in trouble. It was all dad's fault. And I went, dad, being a woodworker, as my finger will attest, every woodworker's, every, by the way, every shop teacher's got to lose a finger. I could be a shop teacher, all right? I glued all of those legs back together. And I love that couch. And when I sat there, I could see the glue lines. I could see the cracks of all four legs. But it was perfect. Not to my mom. <laughs> but to me and my dad. Listen, that's what I want you to grasp. You're broke. Accept your brokenness. That's one of the first things you have to do to come to Jesus Christ is say, I'm broken. You try to come in and try to say, hey, I'm really good. This is, you want to see the tricks I can do? Do you want to see the things that? No. You got to come and go, I'm broken. And God goes, now we can do something. Because if it ain't broke, it can't be fixed. And so I want you to understand that the process that we're talking about is an understanding of your brokenness. Verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which I, Paul, became a minister. See, the thing is, this story of that he wants to come into your brokenness has been proclaimed. He wants to come into that place, and he wants to put you back together. And you're like, yeah, but listen, they're going to see the cracks. Yeah, they're supposed to. Do you know what it says when it will be perfected? It says, I'll get a new body in heaven. That's when I'll be perfected. But until then, scars and all, bent finger and all, this is who I am. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He bore our brokenness and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That word used to bother me because I realized that the Bible says his bones were never broken. What does it mean he was crushed? It means this, his heart, his very soul was crushed by the weight of my sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. With his wounds, we are healed. Same chapter, Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it is the will of the Lord to crush him. Don't go past that sentence. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And what's scary about it is that Jesus knew that. Can you imagine Jesus at Passover when they killed that lamb and they put that over the doorpost? Jesus goes, that's me. That's me. And when John the Baptist on the, on the day of his baptism goes, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he was born to be crushed. It was the father's will that it would happen. It was the father's will that he would take his blood and wash you and renew you and make you so that you could be in his presence. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It was the Father's will to crush him. Mark 15, 34. And the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I can hear God saying, Because it was my will that it would be so. It is my will that it would be so. You were my price. 
You are my ransom. You are my lamb without blemish that will take away their sins. Romans 5.10. I'll read this to you again. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Once I accepted him, he gives me life. Even though I was once his enemy, but I've accepted him and he gives me life. 1 Peter 2.24, he, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He himself bore our sins. The things that I've done, the things that I've thought, the things that I've tried, he took those on himself. The ways I've hurt my wife, the ways I've hurt my children, the way I've hurt my parents or my sister. He took those upon himself. The ways I've let down this church, the way I've let down the elders, the way that I've done different things, he took those upon himself. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He took that from me so that maybe I would have a different focus and a different direction. By his wounds you've been healed. And one of the things that keeps me from going back to past sins is I know what it costs him. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Amen? And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. A kind act. Putting a bottle of water on someone's car in the morning or writing them a note, leaving it on their desk or making, pulling over and helping someone change their tire or helping someone walk across the street. God's kindness was to crush his son for us. That was his act of kindness. His act of kindness was to say, I needed to have you have an option because the death and the sacrifice of animals was not going to be enough and the option had to come from that which was perfect that which is truly perfect, which is my son. Romans 4, 24 through 25. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, our dead Jesus our Lord. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. We believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, but it goes on in verse 25. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. who was delivered up for our trespasses. Because I sinned, he had to be put up on the cross. But he was raised, listen, Easter morning was raised for our justification. I love the word justification, then so should you. Justification is this word. If you stand before a judge and you are guilty, I mean, caught, hand in the cookie jar, guilty. And that judge looks down from his bench and goes, justified, it's done. No one can say, but, nope, it's done. They can't say, well, you know, nope, it's done. And when Jesus raised from the dead, he goes, I justify my children. Their sin no longer counts against them. And what's interesting is we're the ones that are speaking against ourselves. But God, you know what I did? I don't care. But, you know, four weeks ago, I don't care. But when I was 16, I don't care. I have justified you. I have set you, and I have gotten you the process of being in the presence of my Father. Listen to me. I come into the presence of my Father. My heavenly Father is still broken, but Jesus' blood washes me and completes me and makes me whole. Therefore, I can stand in his presence and say, Abba, Father. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. You need to know you're forgiven, every one of them. And as soon as I tell you that every sin has been forgiven, there's a part of your brain that goes, yeah, but what about? Every one of them. Look what it says. God made us together with, his, with having forgiven us all our trespasses. There's an ongoing joke in our church that one day I'm going to preach what they call a heretic sermon. I'm going to, a heretical sermon, which means I am purposely going to teach that which is not true to see, see if you guys can figure it out. Probably Easter morning is not the Sunday to do that. But what if I changed one word in here? What if I said God made a, God made a life together with him, forgiving us some of our trespasses? What if I just changed that phrase to some, not all? As soon as that happened, we would go into a tailspin. Because then we'd worry, what is the ones that are not covered? And we'd spend our whole life going, oh, well, maybe when I shot my sister with a BB gun, when that happened, maybe that was it. Or when I hit her with the nunchucks, that would be it. But no, it says they were giving us all our trespasses, all of them. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Is that, folks, if there is a picture, that is what I want you to have. I know what debt is. I know what debt is. And by legal demands, I'm supposed to pay it. And God walks up, takes that, and says it's paid, nails it to the cross for all to see. It's paid. Jeff doesn't owe anything because I paid it. Right in the bottom, in his blood, it says, paid in full. Look at that. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. First Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. This next passage I want you to grasp what we're about to say here. It says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and, and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. Who gave himself. God asked it of him and Jesus accepted. Remember in the garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Our last passage. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Folks, Adam and his sin brought about the brokenness. I can really say that. For as a man came brokenness, by a man has also the fixing of that brokenness. Folks, everything we're talking about is in this verse. At the beginning, there was brokenness, and it came through one man, but by another man, Jesus Christ, we are healed. It's full circle that Christ knew at the fall of man, that his blood would have to be shed. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall, be, shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first roots, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. So we're waiting for his coming, and we'll be brought to him. Listen to me. We'll be brought to him. And not, watch this next verse. It's powerful. Then comes the end. Do you want to know how the end's going to look? This is how it's going to end. Look. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. So let me explain to you this way. What's going to happen is that at the end, Jesus is going to come in and go, God, here's all your children. And by the way, I just destroyed everything that would hurt them. 
God hears all of your children, and I have just destroyed everything that could come after them. And then it ends. Because he fixes it. He fixes it. And the worst thing you can do is try to hide that you've been fixed. That's where your story is. That's where your testimony is. You need to come and embrace the fact that, honestly, you were broken. And now he has used you. And by the way, it comes in different ways. Let me explain to you this way. The movie Toy Story, when it first came out, Pixar made a mistake. When they made the movie, they made a ton of toys of Woody and of Buzz and of Slinky Dog. Do you know what the problem was? People in droves came to the stores asking for what? The Misfit Toys. You guys remember the Misfit Toys? Remember the duck head? Ducky? Remember the skateboard that had the arm that reached out and pulled them along? People were wanting those toys. Why? Because I think we connected with those toys. Does that make sense? We connected with their brokenness. We connected that they had been repurposed. But by the way, interesting enough, if you watch the movie, there is no way that Woody gets out of the house unless the uniqueness of those toys gets him out of the house. And there's some message for us that when God fixes us, we look different than what we expect to look like. And God uses us in different ways. And what we should be doing is being very proud of a God that goes, they are perfect in my eyes. Cracks and glue and duct tape all over the place. Because he makes us whole again and then washes us clean and allows us to come into the presence of his Father. Folks, you and I are broke. We're broke. And if it ain't broke, it can't be fixed. And I just want you to understand that as we come in to our brokenness and we claim it, he makes us beautiful. And that is the story of resurrection. That is the story of Easter. Is that he, as we saw in that video, is still showing the scars from him coming and fixing us. And so I, I call on you today to think through your brokenness and your need to be restored. I'm going to have Brett and have those who are our worship team come forward. I want to say a couple things to you. Folks, many of you have come and you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. We've had so many of you that, for example, were baptized as children, or, but you've never in your own choice come and said, you know what, I want to confess Christ and I want to be baptized. Next Sunday night over at Discovery Campus at 6.30, We're going to have a baptism service, and after you're good and wet, we're going to go give you tacos. It's going to be awesome. But what happens is, is that in that moment, what you're doing is nothing happens in that baptismal, but what you do is you connect with all the things that are happening, of being washed clean, of being basically dead to the old self and being born again. And we encourage you to go through the, honestly, to go through the obedient act of baptism as a sign to those around you that I was broken and I get to be washed clean and made new. In our last service, four people came forward and said, yeah, I want to do that next Sunday. Two people had already said they wanted to be baptized previously. We have six that are going to be baptized next Sunday night. It's going to be an awesome celebration. But here's what's going to happen. I'm going to stand right over here. And at any time during this worship set, if you want to be baptized, if you just want to be prayed for, But if you want to be baptized, come. I will set up an appointment. We'll talk this week. We'll get it all set up. And then next Sunday night, we're going to have an awesome celebration because people who are broken are going to get fixed. And in doing so, we're going to glorify God. Let me pray for you. And if you want to make that decision, I'll meet you right up front. Heavenly Father, I ask that on this Easter Sunday that we would see that you came into a broken world, by the way, that was broken by our sin that, Father, is waiting itself to be restored. And, Father, you have said, not only will I one day restore the earth, but, Father, you say you will restore us. And, Father, you have brought us in and fixed us and made us whole. And, Father, we still mess up and we still 
are really sometimes the worst enemies of ourselves, and yet you say you love us and you forgive us and you give us grace, and you said we've been justified. And Father, I stand on that justification today knowing that you love me and you love everyone in this room and your son was willing to go to the cross because he loved us and he rose from the dead in power because, Father, he was willing to leave our sin behind. And we thank you for the resurrection. And I pray all these things in the name of your son. Amen.